Good evening, everyone, and welcome, welcome to the Breakout Writer Series with Carla Cornejo Via Vicencio. Give a hands out round for her. Do little claps in the um, chat feature, guys. You know, we're also happy to have you all here and be there for her and for all of us here at BMI. Um, my name is Ariana Razo. I am an MA graduate here at, Uni at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Um, I graduated English this past year, and it is my greatest honor to introduce tonight's event. Um, before we start, a couple things we want to go over. We'd like to take a few minutes to acknowledge that the Black Mountain Institute operates from the city of Las Vegas, the traditional and unceded territory of the Nui or the Southern Paiute people. We encourage everyone in this space to engage in shared stewardship of the land, continued learning about the indigenous people who work and live here and are still living on this land since time immemorial, including the Las Vegas Paiute tribe and the Moapa band of Paiutes and about the historical and present realities of colonialism. Now for tonight's event, let me just first say thank you to our special guests, Carla Cornejo via Vicencio and our moderator, Krista Diamond. And thank you all to our attendees in Las Vegas and Reno, wherever you may be for joining us today. If you are not familiar with what Black Mountain Institute is, our goal is to bring writers and the literary imagination into the heart of the public life. We do this by the way of our year round events, such as this event that you've all so lovingly attended today, other fellowships that we offer to visiting scholars, uh, through student enrichment opportunities and other in innovative media like Witness Magazine and Black Mountain Radio. Uh, a few reminders we also want to talk about really quickly include joining us on March 3rd at 7 p.m. for the annual PhD reading feature. Uh, this is going to feature BMI's illustrious PhD fellows, a hands around for them. Catch up with the second season of BMI Radio at blackmountainradio.org. New episodes every Sunday on your favorite podcast app. You can also purchase a copy of Carla Cornejo via Vicencio's book at the writer's block. There's gonna be a link in the chat. Should be right there for you all. Um, after the moderated discussion, Carla will be taking some questions at the end. So please enter your questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom toolbar. Do not be afraid to ask those questions, guys. The more, the better. Sign up for these events and learn about the rest of BMI's spring session at blackmountinstitute.org. Links are gonna be located in the chat. I would like to take this time now to introduce our moderator and our guest. Our moderator tonight is Krista Diamond, and she is a Las Vegas-based writer whose work has appeared in the New York Times, Narratively, The Huff Post, Joyland, Barrow House, and many others, many other places. Her writing has been supported by Tin House, Sundress Academy for the Arts, and Nevada, and Nevada Arts Council. Prior to moving to Las Vegas, she worked in the national parks and she does not recommend spending summer in Death Valley. I would probably agree with her on that. Our guest today is Carla Cornejo Via Vicencio and she is a writer whose work focuses on race, culture and immigration. And she has appeared in New York Times, The Atlantic, Vogue, Elle, The New Republic, The Daily Beast, N Plus One, The New Inquiry and Interview Magazine. Born in Ecuador, she later became one of the first undocumented students admitted to Harvard University. And she is also a fellow at the Lorraine Powell Jobs Emerson Collective and is a currently a doctoral candidate in the American Studies program at Yale University. Please help me in welcoming him, Carla, Carla Cornejo Via Vicencio with little claps in our chat, please. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hello, Las Vegas. <laughs> Oh, am I supposed to start my reading? Um, I told you all to prompt me when I'm supposed to speak. Um, okay, um, this uh, reading is from my book. Um, it starts here, okay. Um, Liliana left Mexico for the United States 20 years ago and is my mother's age. She used to work in housekeeping until she got sick and now she stays at home taking care of her grandchildren. She does not know whether her breast cancer, newly diagnosed as of two months ago, after years of clean self exams and annual mammograms has any correlation to the lead in water, but she is an optimist and a master of avoidance. So she does not wanna talk about the possibility. After moving to Michigan, like many immigrants, I kept saying, next year I'll leave, next year I'll leave, next year I'll leave, and I never left. It's all a lie. I don't love Flint, but I do love Michigan. I love the greenery, I love nature and there are so many birds in Michigan. My husband gets upset because I get out of bed at dawn every morning to go watch the birds wake up. 
I like rising with the birds. I like to hear them sing. I ask Liliana if she owns pet birds. There is a long pause. I don't own birds. I set them free. You see, my husband got me some small birds as a present, but I don't like them in cages. So I went outside one day and I released them. I have two blue birds and one green bird. I wanted my birds to be wild, so I never even named them. They kept returning to my yard. I used to talk to them about how their day was going. I asked them when they were hungry. They were very attentive. It was her son who told her he had cancer. There's nothing strange about children of immigrants serving as interpreters for their parents at doctor's appointments. But on this day, the doctor spoke to her for a long time and she knew from the look on their faces that something was wrong. Then the doctor hugged her and said, lo siento, the Spanish word for cancer is cancer. But he left it to her son to tell her the news. She went home to be alone. She wanted to be alone, but who could be alone in a house teeming with family? I don't wanna tell anyone I said to myself, I'll treat it and it'll be fine, I'll get out of this. I've always moved forward and removed every obstacle in my path. She learned everything about the disease and asked all the right questions. But then the doctors told her to go back to Mexico because the radiation would be too expensive here and she wouldn't be able to pay out of pocket. Junior asked her if she wanted to go back. She said, I'm not going anywhere. Um, Liliana starts chemotherapy shortly after our first meeting. Margarita found her a doctor who would treat her a reduced fee. And even after I leave Flint, Margarita still sends me periodic updates about Liliana. She takes Liliana to the hospital one day and then texts me to say her nausea is so bad she is thinking of stopping treatment. I text Liliana photographs of beautiful birds to cheer her up. Um, I can't pronounce some of these, but it's a, it's a long list. Um, uh, later, I dreamed that the hawks started coming after she loses her hair from the chemo. Outside her house, the usual yard birds gather, drawn by the feeders filled with the seed Liliana placed out there and the big mature tree surrounding her home. The first time it happens, she sees a raptor snatching a morning dove and fly off with it. It makes her sick and she goes back inside. Then she sees it happen again. This time it is a cardinal and the raptor goes up to the roof to take plunder in its organs. Liliana keeps going outside every day for stretches of time because it helps with her nausea and that's when she starts seeing hawks flying overhead. They are different sizes. They don't look like they could carry dogs and cats like her neighbors were saying, but they do look like they could kill. Soon they begin circling above where she stands to watch them from her yard. And when she stands beneath them with some fear to observe their majesty, she becomes certain that her wings are tied to their wings with string like a puppeteer's and that she can control their movement. They're migratory birds. Perhaps they had gotten lost and then she needed to guide them to warmth and she thought. They'd die if she did not precipitate their movement with her movement, with the movement of flight. She needed to leave this house, the sickness. She feels ill in her heart because she could not leave this house. So the raptors form nests in the large mature trees surrounding the house. And they've been here all this while, flying above her in whatever way she moves that day to hunt or to take shits on her husband when he comes home at night. That was my reading. Thank you, Carla. It's wonderful to hear you read. And thanks for joining us at what I think is 10 p.m. your time. We appreciate it here on the West Coast. Um, I wanted to start by talking to you about something that you wrote in the introduction to the book. Um, you wrote, names of persons have all been changed. Names of places have all been changed. Physical descriptions have all been changed. Or have they? And then later, there's kind of these stories that play off of this idea that you establish. Um, you know, for example, um, in the story that you tell about Ubaldo Cruz Martinez, um, who dies in this flooded basement with a squirrel for company, you say, did this happen? Um, and there's kind of this interesting just playing with, with that idea that you established in the intro. So I was curious if you could talk a little bit about that decision to introduce ambiguity to the book. Um, thanks for that question, Krista. Um, thank you all for indulging me in reading a longer passage than usual. I usually read for like 30 seconds. Um, I just hadn't like read my own scene since I wrote it and was um, sort of captivated by it um, because of the them thematics. Um, you know, um, you know, the question of ambiguity is like interesting. Um, because I think that's where I find the most truth as uh, as a human person. And I think that you find a lot of richness in ambiguity as an artist. Um, you know, and I don't really like speaking abstractly. Um, 
when I know that I'm like being listened to. Um, but I, uh, you know, I, I do think that there, if you want to write truthfully, you write in spaces of complexity, grayness, and ambiguity. So something that is absolutely true or something that is absolutely false, um, something that is like absolutely good or absolutely bad, black and white, like I'm not interested in inhabiting those spaces as a writer. Like I'm interested in where I can um, form new things, like a new, um, and I know this is not a new genre, but I thought I was playing with so many different genres, so many different things. and. Um, I thought that only that could convey um, the truth of what I was trying to depict. Yeah, um, and speaking of genre, that kind of leads to the next thing I wanted to ask you, which is how you're kind of reckoning with this idea of being like a journalist versus being a human and a storyteller in this, um, you know, somebody with deep empathy for the people that you're that you're writing about rather than someone who you say like, it feels unethical to put on the drag of a journalist. Um, and you say, I'm not a journalist. Journalists are not involved in the way that I have gotten involved. So I'm curious how that self-awareness about the roles and the limitations of roles and, and genre influenced this book for you. I mean, I think there was an awareness that um, every uh, that, that, a, that a lot of things are drag, um, that, you know, the, the role of a journalist is a drag, um, just like the, you know, the role of an author is, right? Um, and I'd, um, you know, sometimes when I am in certain social situations that are difficult for me, as like me, I like start to look at them from like a reporter's like uh, mindset, like, and I become genuinely curious about um, like a child, like banging on a piano. And like, I start just being curious about that child, right? As opposed to like me inhabiting me, like start having like a freak out because I don't like that noise. And like, it has, I have a sensory freak out. So putting on like the drag of a journalist is something that I know I can take on and put on and take off, right? Um, <clears throat> It was a choice for me to not do that in um, for, for this first book. I didn't want to just approach out of a place of curiosity or fact finding or you know thesis proving or you know what I mean. What what um, compelled me to write this book was like a true like hunger for questions that cannot be answered. And so it would have been uh, misleading for me to try to like use the, you know, the third person and quote statistics at you as if though I'm some kind of authority when like my intentions were very clear about why I was writing and how I was writing. Did that affect the reporting process for you? Like when you're interacting with people, do you feel like there's a, a shift in how you approach the people you write about in this book? versus maybe how you might approach things where you are like really just sticking with that kind of very traditional role of the journalist? Um, <clears throat> you know, the, uh, I think like the traditional, the, the tools I use to gather uh, that information, those are still bound by like the very solid and necessary laws of journalism like <clears throat> you know I respect my subjects I don't invent lies I don't um treat people in power differently than I do people who are disadvantaged I don't bribe people for stories I don't you know there there's there's just like um I work for publications sometimes that fact check and um, you know, I, I did a lot of freelance fact checking for many years. Like I uh, understand the importance of notes and recordings and primary sources and, you know, all of these things. It's not like I'm relaxing my standards and I'm going to be lax about being a reporter 
and I make doing this hybrid because I'm neither a good uh, writer nor a good reporter. I can be pretty good at both. Like I am choosing to combine like methodologies to create something interesting. The tweaks I'm allowed to make because I'm not a, like a journalist journalist is, you know, some things like the exchange of money, for example. Um, I have a friend who's a journalist who was in a situation where like a, a kid she was working with as a subject um, needed a vaccine and the family did not have like a hundred dollars to pay for the vaccine. And so the kid couldn't be enrolled in school. It was something like that. The details, I don't really remember, but she couldn't, she couldn't contribute to, to the, she couldn't contribute to that because she was working on that story. And, um, you know, whereas while I was working on the book, there was like these kids in Flint needed a laptop and I did that because I like it, it was um, part of the, uh, the, uh, the book was being written to convey the, the, you know, the, the vantage point of a child of immigrants, which gets involved. And which is um, an unreliable narrator in that they're that they're it's skewed by love, you know, it's all skewed by love. And so um, I would, you know, now when I do or, or something that requires reporting, I, you know, I'm not sending them laptops. But at the time, it was part of the like emotional connectivity that um, that I was um, fermenting with my subjects. Yeah. And, and on the note of that emotional connectivity, you talk about your own story, your own family. Um, I really love that this book is the story of other people, you know, these day laborers from Staten Island, the, these 9-11 first responders, people in Flint. But it's also a really personal story about you and your family. Um, so I'm curious what that was like for you crafting this larger, like long form narrative where you are weaving together other people's stories and your own stories. Um, how, did, how did you go about kind of finding that balance and weaving those experiences together, your own personal background and family and these other stories? Um, well, yeah, like I, you know, I, I try to, to um, lean into um, the, you know, inherently subjective and, you um, <laughs> like trauma informed uh, perspective of writing as a child of immigrants instead of pretending that it didn't exist. Um, so, uh, you know, I was like, obviously when I look at the news, it is news about um, like monsters that could kill us, right? And so um, it, um, it, it was, you know, a story of the nation, <laughs> the nation, it was a story about, i you know, the best that I could do to convey what it was like to, uh, just be undocumented, like just a regular bloke, um, during the Trump years, um, where you're not like talking about Trump all the time or like, you know, I, I, like I said, I really wanted to tell just random stories. So, but of course I told it in the first person because I, I wanted to, you know, to show like you're, you're looking at this, you're looking at everyone, but thinking about your parents, you're looking at everyone, you can get 11 million people and you're thinking about your parents. So I, I, you know, the first person was a, also a, a nod to that. What was it like interviewing your own family for this? Um, necessary. It was, it was, it was fine. And also I mean, uh, you know, they, they, you know, it was, it was, um, <clears throat> it was boring. I mean, I know their stories, you know, they kind of stick to their stories. I grew up listening to their stories. You know, they have their coming to America story. They have, sorry, my dog is snoring. Maybe I should adjust his sleeping position. Oh, hi, this is, uh, I'm not even gonna go into it. Um, but you know, they have their stories. My, my dad has his like my time in the military service stories. Um, and so, you know, it was sort of like trying to profile a celebrity um, because, you know, they think of themselves as 
you know, characters. And so they were like, here are my stories of when I went out with Marlon Brando. And you're like, I've heard that joke. And I read that story in Star Magazine. That's what it was like interviewing my parents. Do you feel like writing about them after doing those interviews, you kind of have to look at them as characters? I don't talk to them anymore. I don't, I mean, I talk to my mom. I mean, I, um, you have a great access to, I don't know how to say this. <laughs> One, I'm, I'm a person who um, already sees every, everyone as a character. I already see myself as a character. I, I, I think of everything in terms of scripts and, um, and uh, you know, choreographies and, and expectations and, and, um, and, I, uh, and I hate it when um, people buy into the script or, or expect me to. And so there was a point where um, there, the, there was a messaging where I, you know, felt that there was an understanding of me as like this, um, this like punk undocumented girl who was saying it was okay to be mad at your parents. Um, but then I would do like events and people would say like, I bet your parents are really proud of you. And, and then it, I realized that I was sort of like being marketed as like punk ink. But then when I, you know, I would tell people like, oh no, I cut out my dad or like, I want to talk to my mom. <laughs> or I would be like, you know, I would joke about this. This is gallows humor, but I would be like, yeah, COVID didn't kill my dad. And, um, and there was always a, a, a bristling because there's still a, I think a fundamental need for all of this to subconsciously um, be, you know, something that I'm doing to, to make my parents proud. And so, uh, <clears throat> you know, people ask me what they're up to now. I don't know. Yeah, and it sounds like there's like a, a gap in the way that you perceive yourself on the page versus like how you're like marketed to, to audiences. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, I, the, the, the problem is I don't want, I don't want to worry about that. Like, I think it's, I think it's terrible to, to worry about that while you're writing. It's just, you know, it's bad for your writing. Um, it's hard to be, um, a, you know, a Latina and, uh, you know, an immigrant who is, it's, it's not a crowded field. Um, and so a lot of things end up feeling like there's a representational uh, responsibility that I don't want uh, thrust on me. And so like, I'm being forced to think about some these things sometimes um, in a way that I think I could more easily reject if I you know, wasn't, didn't have this background. Yeah. And on, the, on that point of representation, the, I imagine like when you were building this like narrative, there are so many different stories that you had that you could have told. Um, what was it like to pick like these specific stories, you know, the specific stories of these people in Staten Island, the specific stories of these people in Flint? Um, how did you go about deciding like which, which voices to represent in this? You know, I, I love that question because at first when I used to um, be asked about that, I <laughs> I would get really like defensive be- and, and like anxious because I didn't know that I had a, re- I was like, it was like, I went, you know, I started out with this big list of cities, this big list of ideas. I wanted there to be like some spiritual reason why I um, ended up going and then I became defensive and I was like, it was just the most logistically, you know, possible. And now I think I've ended up somewhere where it's like, some of these stories were, it's sort of how you end up building community, right? Some of these stories were just logistically possible for me. Like I talk sometimes about how there was this, there was this really, there's this really rich story that I wanted to explore in um, in Oregon, um, and but it was such a specific story that if I had written about it, 
it would have, the identities of the subjects would have been revealed and they may have, well, would have lost their jobs. And I was like, this isn't worth it for me. Like, I'm not gonna write about this. Um, but, um, you know, some stories like end up, you know, I kept going back to Staten Island. I kept going back over and over. It was just closer. I, you know, didn't feel comfortable flying. I didn't want to go to the South. I didn't really want to go to, you know, lots of places where I felt unsafe. Like I've been on a plane a handful of times. And um, so the list kept getting smaller and the people that I ended up finding just um, were incredible. And I think it's sometimes like, you know, like the person that you end up marrying, it's like, they were probably close to you geographically too, you know, um, where you probably went to the same school or church or whatever, but you also found your way to each other. And like, I uh, just cheesy as that sounds, that's how I uh, met some really great people. I love that. Um, and I'm also curious, like when you're going about this process, you, you mentioned that that every single person you interviewed, um, you asked them about regrets. Um, were there other questions that you asked everyone? Sorry, he's snoring. Um, I, um, <clears throat> I'm sure that probably I didn't ask like one or two people about regrets, I know. Um, I tried to ask everybody, I mean, I tried to just deeply think about like, moving, leaving everything, showing up somewhere new, taking a shower, going to sleep, and then the next morning, starting your life, looking for work, not knowing the language, starting a family. And, uh, you know, all of these things, like, when I, I, when I just sort of start, you know how sometimes, like, you don't even have to be high, but you could be high. And you look at like a word and you look at it so intensely that it, it, you don't recognize it anymore. It could be like the word of that. I started thinking about like, like the life of someone like my mom and like looked at it so closely until it, the parts were so, you know, so varied that I could just see each of them as so strange. And I had no idea how someone could do that. I had no idea how somebody could marry so young or um, stay with somebody for so long um, that didn't make them feel good all the time or how somebody could leave their child in another country for years, which I know many immigrant parents do and I don't blame them for, I never have, but I was curious, right? And so each of those things that I have gone to grad school I've been lot, around lots of proud Latinos. Like I'd heard all of the, uh, you know, the sort of the, the canned responses and, and theories and, you know, all of these things, but I just wanted to be like, what is it fucking like, you know? So I talked to people and I would be like, <laughs> I, you know, I would, you know, they'd, they'd say they you talk about their husbands. I would be like, was, you know, was, if I felt comfortable with them, I felt they felt comfortable with me. I'd be like, did you have ever have any other boyfriends? You know, is that your first boyfriend? Like, is that the only man you've ever been with? Because, you know, it was important for me to, to learn about that, you know? Because even if I just know that detail about like an undocumented woman, that just opens up a whole different world of understanding. And also my ability to relate her to other women around me who are like suburban moms who also married young, had kids young, have only been with the first man who told them, you know, a nice thing. And so then you start to see this very specific thing, but you also see them as real people. And so I think, <laughs> I forgot what the question was, but I think what I did was like, stare really hard at the word of the until I didn't recognize it as a word anymore. Yeah. And so much of that, that process seems like this relationship building is so key to, to telling these stories. Um, how did you approach that? Especially when you might've been dealing with people who maybe were not super comfortable 
opening up to you or being candid with, with you, you know, they maybe had concerns for, for their, for their safety with the details that they might be telling you. How, how did you kind of balance, like, you know, wanting to honor like their, their safety and their trust with wanting to tell the story? Um, you know, well, I, uh, one thing I did is, I mean, I, I was just sort of aware of what the dangers were, right? So um, change names, change location, change the descriptions of some things that were like identifiable, like someone's necklace. Um, it was of a, it was of an amphibian. I changed it to a different amphibian. But then, you know, so if you saw this person and you saw the necklace, you wouldn't be able to identify them. Operating a little bit from a paranoid mind of being like, I don't want someone to find my parents. Um, so I changed those things. And um, I didn't use a recorder because, I mean, God, my partner and I are trying to record something for this American life. The minute I get out my phone, my partner stops talking and starts like, I don't know, speaking in a British accent or something. Like people freak out around recorders, right? And maybe, maybe like they'll speak and they'll tell you something. But I wanted them to like relax and like slouch and like, you know, put on sweatpants and just, you know, talk, confide in me, talk to me. And the recorder, maybe for the more skilled reporter could have done it, but the, the recorder seemed like an impossibility given also that, I mean, I spoke to somebody in the book who was paranoid about security cameras in her. You know, um, I remember, <laughs> this is the end of how I'm gonna answer that question because I could go on forever. But when I was in middle school, we were all undocumented. And I remember that Google's, um, uh, I'm getting lucky or something, whatever that button was, where you could either do a Google search or get lucky. I know that means have sex, so it's probably not get lucky, but um, it gave you like a random website that would come up. And there was a thing that was like going around on like SNL or something. I probably, you know, that um, if you looked up George Bush's IQ and you went, I'm getting lucky or something, it would say like uh, results not found. And I thought that was so funny. And I was like, I don't know, like 11. And I told my parents, my parents freaked out because they thought that that somehow like the government would found, find out that I had like disrespected the president and they thought that they were going to find us, right? Which comes both from a place of like Latin American paranoia, but also as undocumented people, they were so upset and yelled at me and were like so afraid and hysterical that I just remember sobbing afterwards and apologizing and feeling like ICE was like INS or whatever going to come in. And so I know what it's like to live with that fear in your bones. So I just tried to be sensitive, honestly. Yeah. So it's, it's really a tool that I feel like other people wouldn't have in their arsenal. And you talk about like this kind of like laziness and this like caricature that you were seeing in the way that images were depicted in, in the media and in literature as a key motivation for, for writing this book. Um, I mean, something that I find that nobody has ever asked me and I've done press for this book for like three years is why I trusted the subjects. I mostly interviewed men um, and I like went around the country as like an undocumented person, like who does not know how to drive. Sometimes I would go out into like random, like I'm from New York, okay? Like, I. <laughs> I um, like, I live in New Haven. And when my brother came to visit me once, he was like, I love visiting the country. He was not joking. I went to some really rural places and I'm somebody who, when I get into an Uber driver that is driven by a man, I immediately think I'm gonna get assaulted. So it was, how did I, as a young woman who presents the way that I do, who screams vulnerable, um, feel comfortable with dozens and dozens and dozens of very intimate conversations with strangers, a lot of them men, overwhelmingly men, older men, um, 
sometimes, you know, uh, late at night or, you know, about their private life, creating a lot of emotional intimacy. How did I feel safe with that? Because I did. And I haven't been asked about that, which makes me think people don't realize what that's like um, and how that could be a very tricky space for a young reporter or a young writer like me. People somehow assume that like, again, that there's, there's just that slight racialized, you know, angle where it's like that I did this great thing of, you know, getting close to all these people. But like, you know, what usually happens to young women who, you know, get close to a lot of men and become their shoulders to cry on. Like people aren't curious about how as a reporter, I manage that. Like I talk in the book about how I was very careful about what I decided to wear. I remember I had like the same uniform the entire time that I wrote the book, except when I was in Miami, because it was hot, but also I was interviewing all those ladies. It was just like, like an oversized black blazer um, that completely hid my body, a severe black bun. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I had a very um, abrupt introduction into um, what it feels like to be looked at and how you want to uh, present yourself to men to be uh, seen as a figure of authority. Um, so, you know, uh, I think, you know, when you hear about young women reporters who <laughs> cover like Wall Street or I don't know, the border, like it's important to ask them about, um, I don't mean you, I just mean in general, like over the past few years, it's important to ask them like, how did you do it? You know, cause they probably uh, had to be very smart. Absolutely. And that, that makes me think of, there's a section in the book where you're talking about building these relationships with these men in Staten Island and, you know, wanting to develop this closeness. And then there's one person that keeps calling you like late at night and just, you know, wanting to, to just talk and obviously like needs someone there to talk to, but you kind of touch on that, that uncomfortable feeling of maybe having somebody push against those those boundaries. Um, and it's such a, it seems like such a fine line to tread, to, to build that emotional openness and, and trust, but also to, you know, not have people broach that. So I think we have some questions in the Q and A um, that we can turn to. So hope, um, Pasquale, hopefully I'm pronouncing your last name right, Hope, um, asks, she said, there was, a, there was a part written of how the monarch butterfly is not an accurate symbol for the Latinx community. What would your ideal symbol in replacing it be? Be like this. Thanks. Marcella uh, Rodriguez Campo asks, how did your family react to your book? And how did you navigate that? I know you kind of touched on this a little bit, but is there anything else you'd like to, to say to that? Um, litigiously and with my lawyers. Steli Stonecipher asks, Carla, earlier tonight, you said you see everyone as characters. Um, is your writing and reporting of this book, which characters in your writing and reporting of this book, which characters? surprised you most who didn't quite meet your expectations or went off script? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, okay, so I spoke to um, this, and maybe his name was Kenneth Feinberg. He was a lawyer who negotiated the Agent Orange lawsuits. And he also was the person who calculated the amount of money that was gonna to go to the uh, confirmed victims of 9-11 families. And I spoke on the phone with him and um, it was a, you know, the conversation felt like when I have a panic attack and my partner used to like throw me out into the backyard, like when it was like 10 degrees outside and it was just like, 
frigid air. And it was very like, it woke me up, like talking to him. He was a lawyer that was trained to make Agent Orange seem legal, seem like it could be, you know, it, 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 he, he, he knows how to massage language is what I'm saying. And so talking to him and hearing him talk clearly to me um, was surprising. And um, I felt like it was a good uh, reporting moment for me. Cynthia Moreno Robles asks, did having to look a certain way as a woman ever bother you in interviewing your subjects? Um, so, you know, that's the, um, so that's the thing. So like one is that I don't, I respond by like not, it's a complicated question. Like one, I know that for example, I am contrarian by nature. I want to be true to myself. And I remember, um, as a, as a young person loving the freedom with which artists seem to move through the world. Like they didn't have to answer to the rules of society or propriety. And that was really liberating for me as a person who felt very out of place and who felt, you know, like I was a little, I walked around with a scarlet letter. Um, and, you know, as I grew older, there have been like lots of journeys through understanding my mental health and stuff. I learned that I was on the spectrum. It helped understand why I don't really have an understanding of, nor any regard for like social um, constructions and like rules, right? And so, um, you know, the, the idea of like what you wear to go interview is interesting because, you know, I remember reading this article in the Times, uh, maybe the New York Times Magazine about, it was written by a, a woman who was talking about how she chose the outfit to go testify against a professor who had sexually harassed her. And it was written like focusing on the fashion, like it was like in fashion writing, it was good, good for fashion writing, but it was about like how you try to I guess, make yourself look respectable, not seductive, and maybe like rapeable according to what like society considers, you know, like a white innocent. And um, of course that's in my head all the time. Of course that's in my head all the time. Um, but I think the way to authentically be myself is to not, not res to not respond to that. Um, because it doesn't matter what you wear or look like. And the whole point is like somebody like me is always going to be seen as an avatar in the minds of the people who see me. And I can only control myself. And therefore I have, I fiercely protect my bodily autonomy, my agency, what I look like and my freedom. People can do whatever the fuck they want with me with the avatar they have of me in their minds. And they probably do, but I can control how I move in the physical world. And so honestly, I just, you know, dress and act how I want. Yeah. Looks like we have one last Q and A question. Um, if anybody else has any questions, feel free to pop them in the Q and A. Jenny says, hi, Carla. A couple of years ago, I started therapy. And I also broke ties with the papas, but my healing process started when I read your book. It was the first to articulate a pain that I didn't even know was there. Were you able to find personal healing from writing this story or was it personally triggering? And are you aware of how your book affects Latinos who may have never before read a narrative written for them? Um, that means a lot to me, Jenny. Thank you. Um, I mean, I wrote the book had of a real hunger for not having something that felt like I wasn't being gaslit. You know what I mean? Um, where I, I just wanted to, and by see myself represented, I don't mean like, like a brown girl in pigtails, right? Or who comes from Queens or that. What I meant by seeing myself represented was like someone who had the same, who was tortured by the same things. And, a lot of that 
goes back to migration and it goes back to um, being a young brown woman and being queer and being undocumented. But like, I was just looking to describe um, feelings, experiences, confusions that I had never seen someone put a word to. And so um, when someone says that they connected to my book that way, it means a lot to me. Um, of course it was triggering to write about my parents. And there were so many mom moments where I made like half-hearted attempts at like breaking down and crying and saying, never again, I'm not writing about my parents again. And my partner would support me. And then I'd get a, um, and it wasn't just my parents, but it was about undocumented immigrants in general, because like I said, I see them as my parents and their vulnerability makes like, um, puts me in a lot of, um, sets off a lot of PTSD alarms in me, sometimes has, has gotten me very ill. Um, and so I could see myself having a future uh, with the market demand of me writing about undocumented immigrants. In that future, I would have made money and, you know, become Miss Undocumented America. But um, I would have been so unwell. And um, so I spoke to my editor, my book editor, and I um, talked to my partner. And um, I said, I am not going to write about my parents again. Um, like, and I'm not gonna write about undocumented immigrants anymore. And my um, editor um, believed in my talent and not just the story, you know, not just that. And, um, you know, uh, supporting me writing uh, a novel. And, you know, also to his credit, uh, David Remnick at The New Yorker, I wrote a piece for him um, that, you know, that was, you know, autobiographical. And he called me and said, what do you want to write about, you know? And, uh, and, and of course, it's a wonderful opportunity as a writer, but I don't think they know how life-saving it is <laughs> to be able to, to write and see where, where I'm curious and where I want to go and not just constantly have to mind my suffering to, you know, to pay my bills. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about, I'm just curious, how does knowing that affect what you are working on now? If, if you are willing to talk about anything that you might be writing right now, any, any projects that you have in the works? Um, it just was a, it was so, it was, it was a relief as a, you know, I, I mentioned, um, I went, you know, to a, a small um, group yesterday, uh, uh, earlier today, I went to a class and I talked about, um, you know, how sometimes you procrast I procrastinate a lot before I work on something. And, uh, and I sometimes realize it's because there is a little bit of a, of a demand in that writing that I feel like there's, 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 there's something um, demanded of me that I don't want to do. There's like something choreographed for me, a dance that I don't want to do. And it feels so liberating when I realize, oh, I don't have to do that. You know, this scene doesn't have to end that way. That person doesn't have to say something. This person doesn't have, this character doesn't have to make that choice. Like I don't have to do uh, something that um, my body is saying, nope, right? And so when I, didn't have to fucking write about my parents anymore or about my, you know, five years in Ecuador and like acting as if though talking about migration as a topic could encapsulate, you know, everything that's wrong with me when I'm just, you know, I'm just insane, right? Like I can just say that and not have to go into it. Um, it gave me so much more, I just went wild with imagination, um, truly. I was just like, the world is my oyster. I could do whatever the fuck I want, which is why I find it so interesting when, um, who's, when people who can write about whatever they want and have always been able to, why they write about such boring things sometimes. 
Yeah. Can you imagine? <laughs> so we've got one more question from Riley Griffin. Uh, Riley asks, are there any writers or journalists who have helped or informed your own style? What kinds of resources beyond interviewing your subjects did you turn to in reporting this out? Um, you know what? Um, I took a, a class with uh, the American anthropologist, Catherine Dudley, Kate the Duds Dudley. Only I call her that. Um, and she uh, introduced me to some really great ethnographies and some really fucked up ethnographies. And she also just created a, a uh, just an environment in the classroom where I was able to form so many of my own ideas about um, recording stories and narrative and, and relationships with subjects and ethics and all of that. So no, not like writers or journalists, but that, you know, um, my conversations with, with Kate Dudley and the books she introduced me to, um, tell you what are the books? Um, those are afterlife, afterlife and what's the ghostly, ghostly matters. I don't know, there's just, um, you could Google like Kate Dudley's <laughs> syllabi or something. Um, but that just made me like profoundly think about what in grad school, and I guess what, you know, smart people call the ethics of representation. Um, and so I felt like I had a lot of ideas about that by the time I started writing. Susan Stewart on longing. Susan Stewart on longing. Write these down. We've got uh, another question from Cynthia uh, Moreno. I struggle a lot with trying to accept that there are people who simply do not care about topics that are extremely sensitive or just simply important topics that we should all care about as humans. My question, I guess, is to know, how do you go about it? Uh, should we just accept it and move on, give up altogether and submit? Um, number one, never submit to anything unless you want to. But um, two, it just, You have to have something to say, I think, in order to um, be a compelling writer, but you also have to have a really um, unique way of saying it, or maybe not just unique, but cool, memorable, groovy. I don't know, you know, like Jonathan Franzen writes about birds sometimes. He wrote a piece for The New Yorker about, um, about birds and he got into a fight with the Audubon Society and then he went viral on this piece about birds. And then people were of course not talking about the piece, but talking about Jonathan Franzen, the entity, the uh, you know, epithet. And um, it was a piece about birds. And I, uh, it's, it's not really just you know, the topic, make people care, you know? Write it in a way that they, um, that they have to pay attention to it and have a response to it. Um, you know, that doesn't mean it's gonna be good writing. Like Candace Owens gets people to pay attention to things that she considers important topics. You know, having people pay attention to important topics doesn't make you a good writer. Of course, Jonathan Franzen is a good writer. Um, so um, I think, you know, uh, it's, you know, learn how to do different things effectively. Have smart thoughts, write about them intelligently, troll the Audubon Society. I love that. It really speaks to that idea of like, I can't remember who said this, but um, someone said that like, there's a difference between something that's just like an interesting anecdote and something that is an actual story with weight to it. Um, I, I really love that. Um, so I think we're, just about out of time. Is there anything that I didn't ask you or that the audience didn't ask you that you you'd like to share that you wish that we had asked you that you would like to talk about? <laughs> Sorry. Um, sure. Um, uh, um, yeah, I could talk about my makeup. Um, this is like a, uh, you know, um, a little eye and the, uh, <laughs> the mascara is rare beauty <laughs> and um, the blush is rare beauty. 
and um, you can buy it at rarebeauty.com. That's the Selena Gomez line, right? Yes. I think. Yeah. Great. Well, I think that's that's it. Unless anyone has any final questions, thank you so much for being in conversation with us and for reading um, and for for visiting our fiction workshop earlier and chatting with us. It's been such a pleasure to to read your work and hear you talk about it. Thank you. All righty. Thank you to everyone who came tonight. A special big thank you to both Carla and Krista tonight for their beautiful talk. And thank you for moderating. It was amazing hearing Carla talk about all of her experiences. And honestly, I connected so much as well. So thank you for that. Uh, thank you again to all our attendees in Vegas and Reno and wherever you are tonight and for joining us today. Please support tonight's author by purchasing The Undocumented Americans from our friends at the Writer's Block. Link is in the ch chat. Thank you all and have a great night.